Good morning and welcome to the webinar. My name is Troy Baker. I am the director of the Better Business Bureau Educational Foundation. I want to thank everybody for joining us. We have a great webinar planned with Tyler Carlson and Michael Burns to help talk about businesses reopening and what you need to know as we reopen from these stay at home orders that have been put in place the last couple months. So a couple things before we get going. I want to do some housekeeping notes here. Everybody is on mute. The presentation is being recorded and will be shared out afterwards. We are going to take questions at the end of the presentation. So on the panel, the GoToWebinar panel, there is a question section. Uh, please type in any questions you may have and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll be sharing something out after the presentations are over. Any helpful information we have the slide deck you're seeing and the recording as well. If you're having issues right now, you should be able to hear me. Uh, if you can't hear me right now or you're having video issues, you can check your Wi-Fi. You might also have to go log out and log back in to get a better signal on that. But hopefully you can get this put together so that we can uh, you can hear us and have a good experience. With that, I would like to introduce Phil Catlett, President and CEO of the Better Business Bureau serving Western Michigan. Phil, you're muted. Can you hear me? Thank you, Troy. I was just babbling away to myself. Uh, Thank you uh, for joining us this morning. Welcome to this webinar. We are excited uh, to have a couple of great uh, and wise speakers with us this morning with Tyler Carlson from High Tech Building Services and Michael Burns from Active Training Consultants. Uh, it's also a good morning in that a few more restrictions were lifted by uh, Governor Whitmer today. Uh, immediately, we can uh, gather in groups of up to 10 people, if you have not heard. All retail will be allowed to open across the state of Michigan, but by appointment only beginning on May 26th, and that includes auto showrooms uh, open by appointment only. And then beginning on May 29th, medical procedures, dental procedures, veterinary procedures will be started up again, uh, although with some safety rules there. So we're, we're methodically uh, coming back online and, and hopefully uh, this, shut down or slow down or work from home life that you've been living has allowed you to think through uh, how to grow and improve and enhance the way that your business or organization operates. And part of that is just thinking about some of the processes that might become normalized now. I'm guessing that some of the things that Tyler uh, and Michael talk about are gonna be things me aren't only gonna be appropriate for COVID-19, but should be employed permanently, full-time, to help us have safer and better workplaces. And with that, I'm gonna hand off to Tyler Carlson from High Tech. Thank you, Tyler, for being here. Yeah, you bet. Um, thanks for thanks for having us be a part of this. Um, we're excited to uh, obviously partner with you and um, with uh, High Tech Building Services. For those of you that you know, might not know us, we are custodian uh, janitorial cleaning company. Um, throughout the state of Michigan. So like many of you um, have been uh, adapting and um, kind of changing some of the things that we've done um, throughout the course of this uh, COVID crisis. And I'm glad to hear, um, you know, that we're able to sound like we're in the right direction with uh, some of the restrictions lifted going into next week. Um, that's awesome. Um, what I'm going to kind of touch on today um, is really applicable kind of hands-on um, stuff that you as business owners can um, go in and really accomplish whether you already have a cleaning company uh, maybe you you hire out or contract out um, that's great but for many of you um, whether you're you know construction or office or retail manufacturing what have you um, there's there's probably a lot of you that have in-house team members or uh, you know maybe friends or maybe even family members that are in there cleaning um, and regardless of really what option you choose, there's standards that you should really be following uh, just to create that, you know, healthy and safe environment um, that's that's important for you and your customers um, and your and your office staff. Um, Troy, I don't know, did you give me control over the slides here? 
Uh, looks like there we go. Perfect. Um, so as I as I kind of mentioned, having a plan um, as you would before any project, um, you need to have some sort of plan in place. Um, you know, you can't be crossing your fingers and kind of hoping it kind of turns out along the way, um, especially when it comes to, to cleaning and disinfecting. Um, here. Uh, looks like I got a slight delay on the slides. I don't know if you go to the next slide there, Troy. Perfect. Um, the goal really of, of the workspace obviously is to create that disinfecting um, environment, clean environment, um, ultimately just to minimize that possibility of exposure as much as really possible. Um, high touch surfaces, you know, routine cleaning, some of it's common sense. You probably obviously think of your computer mouse, your, your door handles, whether it's the front door or an office door, um, you know, toilets, bathroom seats, those type of things. But for more of the construction and maybe um, manufacturing or on-site um, construction workers, that could be, you know, steering wheel of the work trucks, um, you know, break room tables, punch card stations, um, some of those things that you might not think of um, off the top of your head or tool trailer handles. Um, again, as, as practical as possible, it might be hard to disinfect a drill or a nail gun every time you know you're cranking out a roof and, and popping on shingles but um, there are certain things that you can do um, and first what I'm going to kind of touch on is if you already have a cleaning company in place um, you know whether it's in your office or a manufacturing facility or what have you maybe a retail space um, there really are, are certain things that you should be keeping track of um, Troy can you go to the next slide perfect and you never want to assume that all areas of the workspace, um, you know, are are being disinfected thoroughly or being cleaned. Um, I would highly recommend reaching out to the account manager um, if you do have that cleaning company and just touch base with them on your current contract. Um, typically, um, you know, a contract is built on the frequency of cleans and the square footage of the cleans and then how many team members are in there actually cleaning the facility. So you never want to assume that that back office is, is always getting cleaned or that side room or, or that warehouse area where occasionally employees, um, you know, gather during smoke break or, or lunch break or whatever. Um, you should really make sure that's on the scope of work. Um, again, just to create um, consistency and make sure that environment is being disinfected um, consistently. Um, communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, again, you just never want to assume anything, even when it comes down to the type of products being used. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit later, but um, there's certain standards that the CDC put out that you really want to make sure um, is being complied with. Uh, the scope of work, um, probably not new for a lot of you, depending on your industry, but essentially this, again, just lays out the, the frequency um, of, of when that cleaner is in there um, disinfecting your area and the days of the week. Um, so is the current contract Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but you're under the assumption, you know, every every single day, five days a week, um, you're having that company come in and clean. Um, you just need to make sure that you're communicating that and what your contract says. Um, typically, I, I would say that most companies should be willing to, to work with you if you have a cleaning company. Um, if you have employees that are, are working remotely, um, you know, you have a third of the office and cubicle that's working remotely and you want to focus on another area, um, you know, talk with the sales rep or your account rep, um, see if you can kind of adjust the schedule um, without adjusting the price. Obviously, we're all um, budget conscious right now, uh, but you should be able to work with them on that. Um, another thing is just the, the EPA really has a, a standard set out for requirements that are extremely important. Um, and the reason I, I bring this up is, you know, I can't bring my stapler on my desk, hop on a roof and expect to start popping a row of shingles on. You need to make sure that obviously you have the right tool for the job. So if you're going with the best scented cleaner that either smells like chemicals, so you assume it's, it's killing the bacteria, um, specifically COVID or it has a nice flower scent, so you're spraying everything in the office thinking that's adequate. Um, 
you know, you just can't, you can't go by that. Um, the nose isn't going to cut it in this sense. So you have to make sure that it is EPA registered. And, and basically the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has a list that um, they keep updated. And it's a list of products and chemicals that are approved to kill COVID. Um, and you need to make sure that you're looking out for that. Um, whether you're having in-house team members clean, um, you know, make sure they're using the right chemicals. Um, and I would encourage you even to reach out to your current contractor and uh, just, again, don't assume anything. Um, follow up with them and make sure that um, they are using the right chemicals. As far as the, the type of applications, um, I guess when you, you maybe think of janitors coming in and cleaning, you have, you know, that spray bottle um, or a rag and you're, you're going through spraying things. Um, there's a lot of pretty neat technology out there um, that companies, including Hitech, are utilizing. And um, I don't know if you've heard of hydrostatic, you know, disinfectant sprayers, uh, kind of a fancy name for like a, a misting machine. If you go shopping at Meyer or, or Family Fair, maybe you've seen, you know, in the produce aisle where occasionally those misters will pop on and it kind of keeps the produce um, wet and from spoiling. Well, it's kind of a similar concept to that except this uh, electrifies uh, static charge so as you walk into an area and you use this piece of equipment um, it gets underneath of the desk not just on top of the desk um, it sticks to that surface um, and, and really kind of alleviates maybe some of the human error where you might not be able to spray a certain spot or, or reach in there um, it's, it's a pretty neat tool that um, a lot of companies are utilizing and requesting from us right now so that might be something to Consider if you are working with someone, um, see if they have that um, available for you. Um, verify that the cleaning is getting done. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware there's certain government incentives that are uh, keeping some employees from showing up for work or, or delaying coming to work. And you really can't have that be an option with um, cleaning. So you want to make sure with your contractor if somebody does call in sick and the janitor doesn't show up um, is there somebody still in place whether it's a sub or maybe a team lead in the area are, are they showing up to clean your office um, what kind of check and balances do you guys have in place just to make sure when your team shows up to, to do their job that it's a safe environment and there's no miscommunication um, for the, the type of plans, uh, now I'm going to kind of switch gears for employees that you have in-house that are, are maybe willing to clean or, again, maybe friends or family members, um, whether it's cutting back on cost or that's how you've always done it, um, you need to make sure that you have a plan. I know, uh, I think Michael Burns is going to talk a little bit on that in the next section, but um, essentially something is, is better than nothing. And the reason I bring that up is, let's say... Um, you know, you have John in there cleaning on Monday. Um, he gets sick or he's on vacation and Wednesday rolls around and now you have Jack in there getting ready to clean and Jack thinks, I'm, I'm pretty sure I cleaned the tables in the cafeteria and probably the microwave. And uh, yeah, the smells clean, I, I should be good to go. But you need to make sure you have some template to reference um, just to alleviate again that human error, create a process, um, make it as, specific as possible, um, especially for those high touch points that I referenced earlier, um, whether it's a desk mouse, computer mouse, kind of go through and just, you know, walk through the area, see what people are touching, um, see what doors they're, they're using, um, things of that nature. Um, you got to decide the cleaning frequency again. Um, are you having people do this every day, which is highly recommended? How frequently are you doing it throughout the day as you're having customers in there? Um, as you're having team members walk around the office, on the job site, opening up the, the tool trailer, um, what kind of stuff do you have in place to prevent that uh, spread of um, bacteria and germs? Um, as I mentioned earlier, that, that EPA registration is extremely important. Um, again, don't just go by your nose and find something that smells great and roll with it. Um, you need to make sure that you're doing your due diligence. Um, the next question is, you know, how, how do you even know what EPA registration is. I'm not in the janitor world. I don't know what all the codes are and, and where to go. Um, at the end of this, I know um, I, I have some information here that will be made available to you through the, the Better Business Bureau. Troy will post that, but they have a website, so it's, it's really not 
too hard, you click on the link, um, you know, you can search what's available for you. Um, you just got to ask around. We partner with a, a company called Nichols. They have a whole hodgepodge of different EPA approved chemicals that are um, at disposals, not just for janitorial companies, but for, you know, individual businesses that are looking for something adequate to um, kill and, and clean this uh, virus up from their workspace. So that's another uh, resource as well. Um, dwell time and contact time, that's something that a lot of people don't think about um, necessarily. If you're going in there and spraying something and maybe it even is EPA approved and uh, you get the green light, you're feeling good, you're going through there spraying your whole um, work trailer and cubicles and offices, um, but the dwell time will be on the, the label there. It'll be on the container. Um, you need to make sure that it has contact time um, to kill that that bacteria on the table. So if you're spraying and wiping, um, it's really not going to do a whole lot um, is what it's meant to do. So again, the old fashioned, just follow instructions um, and make sure it's, it's doing its job. Um, and you're going to do that with just all the frequently touched surfaces as well. Um, I mentioned that hydrostatic sprayer. Um, if your cleaning company or you guys have access to that, um, the dwell time can be drastically reduced. Um, some products require you to have 10 minutes plus of dwell time. Um, that's kind of hard if you have customers rolling in and out. So uh, depending on the product you have, maybe you can cut that down to just a couple minutes or one minute. Um, you just got to do your research and uh, you know talk to an account rep or somebody that um, can help educate you on that for what's the best option for you. Um, OSHA compliance. Um, again, I think Michael will probably touch on this a little bit later. I saw some of his material, but um, if you are buying your own chemicals, um, really the liability is on you. Um, and again, you need to make sure that you have the, uh, the safety data sheets for that, um, which each supplier, um, you know, they're legally bound to provide you with that. Um, if not, you can find um, pretty much all of them online too. But if OSHA comes around and they need to see the safety data sheet um, for your chemicals that you have to fight COVID, you just need to make sure you have those available. Um, and, and readily accessible. Um, providing proper PPE protective equipment. Um, obviously, we've heard a lot about masks and glasses and ventilators and suits that look like you're going to outer space. Um, the CDC, again, has a list of specifically what might be appropriate for you, um, you know, in the office environment or retail construction. Um, so that is something that I would recommend um, taking time. Again, uh, Troy will post that so you guys can click on that and find what's appropriate. Um, another resource is the uh, the chemical that you guys are using to clean the facility. Um, if you get one that um, you know has a label on the safety data sheet as well, it'll say right on there what PPE is required. And uh, again, that's what OSHA wants to see um, that you're complying with uh, not only the standards but absolutely with the uh, the product that you're using at the time. Um, and and really kind of that's uh, that's the gist of it. Here's the uh, links that I referenced earlier that I know uh, Troy will put on for you. Um, and I know I, I kind of threw a lot at you guys, but summarizing, there's you know just a couple of the key things you need to make sure that you're adhering by the, the CDC guidelines, obviously, um, and they have really easily um, referenced tools there for you. Um, EPA approved products is one of the number one things you have to make sure that you're even using the right stuff um, otherwise it's really not going to make a whole lot of difference um, as far as killing the bacteria and uh, the germs for covid um, and again feel feel free to reach out um, ask around click on that link and, and find a product that works for you um, i'm now going to kind of pass it off to michael and uh, what's nice is he is a uh, fellow business owner like many of you um, the owner of uh, active training consultants he does a lot of running around. Uh, we were just talking before uh, we started here. He was uh, up in the UP working uh, with some contractors and uh, construction workers. So he's uh, he's hands on in the field and uh, seeing a lot of um, kind of the practical on site stuff that many of you are dealing with. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of let him take it from here. All right. Well, thank you, Tyler. I really, really appreciate the intro. Um, and to just uh, uh, touch a little bit about what you're talking about, you were talking about the SDSs and stuff like that. Um, I am, I'm the safety guy. I, uh, I'm the one who thinks everything about safety, what to do with the, 
the best way, the right way, the correct way, so everybody gets to go home with all their fingers and toes. That's that's what my life is all about. And uh, as Tyler was talking about, uh, you know, OSHA compliance with your uh, safety data sheets, uh, I wanted to quick point out that uh, you know section four of that safety data sheet is all about first aid. So. What are you going to do if one of your employees gets that uh, gets that chemical in their eye? If they inhale it, if they ingest it by accident, um, if it gets on their skin, uh, Section Seven of that SDS is all about what kind of PPE that you have to wear, what kind of gloves, uh, goggles, mask, respirator, whatever the case may be. A uh, lot of great information in that. And just like Tyler was saying too, uh, you know, if OSHA does come up to you, they are going to want to know where that SDSs are, uh, where they're located at. You want to make sure that they're easily uh, accessible to all your employees. All right, hey, all right, I got control of the screen. This is fun. Anyway, so uh, developing your, your plan. So you want to make a list of your current business processes right now. What are your policies and procedures that you already have? Uh, what are they going to require? What kind of modification do you have to have? Um, identify and purchase uh, needed PPE. Uh, we are in a, a whole different, uh, different times now, you know. Uh, we have to create cleaning procedures, just like Tyler was saying, whether you, you hire a company to do it or you're having in-house do it, uh, but show the public what you're doing to protect the workers and your customers. Uh, public is definitely gonna wanna know exactly what you are doing in order to help them out. You, you wanna make sure that they feel safe. Um, create that list that indicates new protocols, uh, safety procedures, social distancing, maybe some marketing. Uh, discuss it with your staff members to ensure that every point is understood. Um, and then include an, uh, an exposure plan. You know, what am I going to do if one of my workers shows up with a fever, um, if they don't feel good? What do I have to do for the rest of my um, employees? or the public. Um, respect the process. Um, the process of reopening is likely, and we have already know this, it's, it's, a, it's an ever-changing thing. Um, it's gonna evolve. Like I said, uh, this has never, ever happened before. And, and I'm telling you right now, um, as far as how things are going, there really are no experts in this field. There's a lot of wonderful people that are working with this, don't get me wrong, uh, but this has never happened before. So uh, many people are ready for, for business as usual, but just like you guys all know out there, um, it's gonna remain cautious, um, some overly so uh, for quite some time. Um, I know that, that I have parents who are, uh, who are elderly, who are, I'm very protective of, you know, uh, we go out and we do their grocery shopping. Uh, we literally don't even go into the, uh, we drop off their groceries inside the uh, garage and we leave and wave to them from the windows. It's, it's so different now. Um, some customers may expect more than what the government requires or recommends. Uh, a lot of times uh, the government, um, OSHA, so all of the, all the policies and procedures that are already in place, that is the minimum requirement for your employee's safety. That's the absolute minimum out there. So you can always go above and beyond. And there's gonna be some people out there that are want you to go above and beyond. Um, if you cater your plan uh, to the cautious, consumers will respect your new procedures, you know? Uh, the lack of a COVID-19 safety plan will, will undoubtedly cause uh, loss of some customers. Um, I know people who are uh, deathly afraid of almost going outside and you know, I respect their wishes. And like I said, you know, there's, there's no experts in this field of reopening after a pandemic. And uh, you know, I've seen people like that before that you know, we have 30 years of experience in, opening up your business after something traumatic like this happens. And the funny thing is it's never happened before. So how you get uh, the experts, I don't know. But 
Um, document, document, document. Just like Tyler said before, uh, share your written exposure control plan. Uh, share it and mitigate it to employees' exposure. Uh, it should include these things right here, training and administrative controls. What kind of uh, administrative controls can you put in? Make sure that your employees are trained on everything. Uh, you need to put in policies for governing social distance, that whole six foot rule. Gall uh, policies for governing uh, disinfection and sanitation. Cotter was talking about that earlier. Um, personal hygiene, you know, there are, uh, there's a, uh, there's actually a, a standard written on personal hygiene when it comes to some of the PPE that people have to wear. Uh, when I was on the fire department, I could not have facial hair. I could have a mustache, but I couldn't have facial hair because that would mess with the seal of my uh, mask. Uh, personal protective equipment policies, you're gonna have to put into place uh, policies and procedures on uh, when to wear that PPE, how to wear it, how to, how to how to what they call don and doffing it. In other words, putting it on and taking it off. Um, how to take care of that PPE properly. What to do with it if it's contaminated. Um, what are you gonna do uh, for positive case protocols? Like I said, you have somebody in your facility. Uh, maybe someday, maybe somebody here listening is, uh, is a hairdresser. You know, the hairdressers are, oh, I need a hairdresser, trust me. But anyway, um, they already are extremely uh, diligent on their on their cleaning. Um, but what are you going to do when you guys open up and all of a sudden you find out that one of your customers yesterday was tested positive for, uh, for COVID-19? You're gonna have to have a policy and procedure in place on what do you need to do to uh, do you need to contact those that were in there yesterday, those that were near that person? Uh, facility closure, closure scenarios. We already know that we have to have a emergency action plan for fires and tornadoes and, and active shooters. And, and, and now we're going to have to have one for COVID-19. And then again, we have to make sure that all of our employees are trained on that new policy. So whether it's the employees that are there full time, maybe it's a, a temp agency that you're going through, even, uh, even temp uh, employees have to have the same safety training that your full time employees do. Oops, oh, how do I go back one? Can I go back one? Uh, yes, I can, maybe. Okay, there's a lag there. Okay, I got that one. There, I won't touch anything. All right, so customer interaction. So retail businesses, like I said, review your inventory of, of business supplies. Uh, you know, what hand sanitizer or cleaning stations will be needed uh, or expected by your customers. You know, like construction right now, construction before you go into the building, you're supposed to wash your hands. So there's actually little cleaning stations uh, set up right before you enter that construction site. Um, consider whether you need to rearrange your store, uh, check out locations, seating, food traffic patterns, restroom policies, dressing rooms. All this stuff has to be in place before you can open up. Um, curbside pickup locations, clearly marked, uh, fast and accessible. Uh, even though your doors may be open, there may be people out there that still want to do the curbside. Um, advertise your, your COVID-19 plan. Uh, as businesses begin to reopen, uh, consumers will be looking for companies sharing their COVID-19 safety plan. What are you doing to make sure that the people that are coming into your facility are going to be, uh, are going to be safe, that you have their best interests? Um, oh, include your plan and protocols and advertising that you're reopening. Let, let, shout it from the rooftops. Let people know exactly what you're doing in order to help them out. Customers want to know uh, that they are entering a, a safe environment, a clean environment. 
Um, ensure response plan, like I said, complies with OSHA guidance. Um, designate a site supervisor to enforce these policies. Now we're talking more about construction sites. And I know uh, personally, I know that not every single construction site out there or construction company out there is going to be able to hire uh, a person to do that. So a lot of times what they're doing right now is they're utilizing uh, people that they already have there on the job site. When I went up north yesterday to Sault Ste. Marie, I had a check on a client of mine and uh, the site supervisor, the uh, construction manager out there, he was that person. Um, he made sure that people were reporting to him before they came on to uh, onto the job site. They had a list of questions that they had to answer, um, went into a different room, took their temperature. Um, so with constructions, we're supposed to create uh, dedicated entry points if possible. Uh, stickers or other indicators uh, to assure that all workers are screened every day. Um, identify some of those choke points, um, high risk areas, you know, hallways, uh, hoist and elevators, break rooms, water stations. Um, you might have to put in the plan there that they have to wear a mask if they're in those choke points. Um, ensure significant, like I said, uh, sufficient hand washing and hand sanitizing stations at that work site. Um, keep workers and patients who are on the premises at least six feet apart. So that's social distancing. And again, we need to provide all the PPE, uh, gloves, goggles, face shields, masks, uh, whatever is appropriate for whatever the job that is being done. Moving to the next slide, there we go. So maybe it's an office. Um, you still need to develop a COVID-19 plan. Uh, there are templates all over the place. You go to, uh, OSHA's website and there's a template there. You go to my OSHA's website, there's a template there. Um, one thing about templates though, you're gonna have to make sure that you that you take that template and and you you customize it. You customize it for your business. There's not a a one plan fits all type thing. Um, can you know make sure it's clear and concise, well worded and updated. Uh, relevant to your location. Uh, make sure it's, uh, you know, again, in a, in a language that that your workers are going to be understanding. Um, to give an example, I can't, uh, when I write policies and procedures, I I put it in, in plain language. I, I don't write like a lawyer or I don't write like the King James version of a Bible. Um, so write it in a, in a way that they're going to be able to understand it. Uh, pro promote a, a work-life balance. You know, we have to understand that, you know, people are going to be, there, there are going to be a lot of people out there that are going to be scared for a very long time. Um, we have to make sure that we take care of all sides. Um, increase the ability of disinfecting wipes, virus killing, hand sanitizers. And again, just like Tyler said in his presentation, there's a place to go for that. Um, again, he will set you up with, with some things that you guys can look at as well. Um, where possible, rely on touch reducing amenities such as double swing push doors, motion sensor lights. There's a whole plethora of things that are going to be coming out uh, in order for this. Um, if it's flexible seating is an option. You know, if a lot of people right now are working from home. Um, but eventually they're going to have to go back into that office. Maybe you're going to have to change things around a little bit. Um, require everyone to clean their own equipment or workstations as soon as they leave or move to a different spot. And again, just like with everything else, we're going to have to make sure that we adhere to that social distancing. Um, again, um, if you guys have any questions, uh, the BBB is there to help you. We're there to help you. Tyler's there to help you. Um, we're all in this together, and that's what we have to remember. Um, there's not a magic uh, a magic button anywhere, um, but I think if we uh, if we all pull together, I know that we could all make this uh, make this a little bit easier on everybody else. So with that, I will turn it back over. Michael uh, and Tyler, a lot of great information uh, that you've provided. 
BBB, as you pointed out, does have a, a compiled list of resources that would help you find the protective equipment. Uh, you can share, if you happen to have it yourself or you know someone who does, you can share that. You can stay up to date on our webinars and important information and resources by industry. And we're adding to that regularly. Uh, and Michael, uh, one, I'll, I don't know if you have any sort of a prototype or fill in the blank plan. Uh, I know one of the things that came up this morning in a discussion we had with a number of our uh, committee members uh, related to BBB, uh, they suggested that we have some prototype uh, plan available out there because so many small businesses in particular are looking for assistance and how to write one and how to organize one and you had a lot of tremendous information in there and BBB does have a plan that we've put together that we're planning on sharing but I wanted to find out Michael from you or you Tyler if you if you have any suggestions that might assist people as they're trying to write up their own plans um from 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 my point of view like I said every Every business is different. Um, when I write policies and procedures or, or plans, I customize it to uh, to that business itself. Um, you know, one one office building might be set up different than another one. They might have different policies and procedures in place. But I can see if I can put something together uh, to help out a little bit. Any anything that either of you might have would be great. We'll share that out. Uh, and obviously. Uh, in both of your cases, you're you're more. If somebody picks up the phone and reaches out to your businesses, I'm sure you'll be ready to to provide ideas and and support in that way too. Absolutely, fantastic. Uh, we're looking to see if anybody has typed in any questions in the chat, and I'm not seeing anything at this point. Troy, do you have any questions or observations? Anything you'd like to say? We do have a couple, and thank you. You can type in questions into that question section there on the the, the uh, panel. So looking at questions that have come in, uh, one question that we get, and we're gonna see a lot of, is there any advice on how you might handle customers who have different feelings about masks? So we all know, and it was noted earlier that uh, different people are going to have different sensitivities and different beliefs going forward. So how do you handle those differences, especially when you have a customer who may not want to wear a mask? I guess this would be, uh, this would be more of a, a legality thing. I know that businesses have the right to refuse if they have a policy written that everybody has to wear a mask. Um, and you come in not wearing a mask, um, I think businesses have that right to to escort that, that individual out. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe you can put it in such a way on your policies and procedures, even a note on your door, um, instead of, you know, beyond this point, you must wear a mask, maybe we can word a little bit different so it's not sounding as harsh. I don't know if that makes sense or not. It made sense in my head, but. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is one for Tyler and, and, and Michael too, probably. Um, a question from another commercial janitorial company. Um, how are you doing health check-ins before work? Uh, this company is using a secure document for them to fill out before entering the facility. Is that adequate? And I would add in, um, how do you best handle check-ins and screenings in an environment that maybe you have people who don't necessarily go to a central location before work? If you start your work at a offsite facility, how do you manage those those different work sites? Yeah, so uh, good question. Um, again, kind of like what, what Michael said, it, it kind of depends on your specific industry um, and, and what template is. Um, again, there's no cookie cutter magic template. Um, I, I wish I could send it out to everybody, but um, what we personally do um, as far as the majority of our uh, work environments, and again, we have a lot of different locations um, so for example we do a couple different healthcare facilities um, 
they actually do provide us with screening. Um, so as our employees arrive for work, um, they do the temperature check, um, the whole nine yards, they fill out the questionnaire. Um, depending on the type of facility, um, we have the employee fill out and uh, we document, um, again, the, a checklist that um, the CDC rolled out that we reference. Um, pretty general questions like a lot of you guys have probably heard or maybe you're already using, um, you know, have you taken your temperature at home this morning? Um, if yes and no, what was it recorded? Um, there is no perfect system, but you can certainly put things in place to do your due diligence. Um, and like Michael said, there's the minimum requirements, um, but in some circumstances, it, it definitely would benefit you to, you know, go above that and uh, do what you can within reason um, to, again, just protect employees and, and make sure that um, if anything does happen, and I think Michael referenced the uh, that hairdresser situation, um, you know, if, if it comes to our attention where an employee is um, confirmed case of COVID, um, you know, it's our responsibility to reach out now and notify fellow workers of that and the customer, um, but it needs to be part of the plan. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that kind of helps answer that at all. And if I could just add one thing to that, we also still have to be discreet. So uh, in, in other words, if we're doing temperature checks at the door, uh, we really can't do it at the door for our employees. It's got to be in the Think of it as HIPAA. You know, I can't have a line out in front of my manufacturing plant. And if I tell you to go left, you go inside the building. But if I tell you to go right, then you have to go home. Um, if that's done in front of everybody, um, it can kind of create a, a, uh, a, a tense situation. Um, so like up north, again, my client, they originate from Detroit or from uh, Ohio, but they have all these places in Michigan that they uh, uh, that they do this at so everybody that goes to work that day will report to the job supervisor again filling out the questionnaire and stuff like that uh, they'll take the temperature um, and record it but um, again just like we mentioned too if somebody if somebody is tested positive you just can't say who was tested positive you can't make that public announcement on the intercom that hey everybody just want to let you know that you know joe uh Joe has been tested positive for COVID-19, so please go home. Uh, you can't give out names or anything else like that. That would be the HIPAA violation. Yeah, that's a great point, Michael. Thank you. Um, when it comes to the written plan, does it need to be only shared with employees or does the government need it too? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, with the written plan, the government doesn't need it unless the government comes in and wants to see it. So in other words, if, if OSHA, um, and that's just how I think, um, if OSHA comes to your facility and wants to see uh, your emergency action plan, they want to see your COVID plan, you have to share that with them. As far as I know, there is not uh, no, no government entity out there is asking you to provide them with that, that I'm aware of anyway. Um, it has to be done. OSHA did state that, even the federal side stated that, that a plan has to be, has to be written and shared with all your employees. And it's the same thing with your contractors. If you have contractors that come into your facility, uh, you need to share with that contractor your policies and procedures or your COVID-19 plan. Uh, you have to make sure that they either follow your COVID-19 plan or their COVID-19 plan is just as good as yours or better. And I'll kind of build off of that, Michael. Um, that's, that's a good point for um, like when we have, whether it's chemical deliveries or equipment deliveries, um, different cleaning facilities that have delivery on site. Um, when the truck driver from whatever company shows up for delivery, um, like you said, you need to make sure that you're adhering by their uh, their standards. So we can't just say, oh, here's the you know the high tech safety plan. They're in accordance with us. Um, we're good to rock and roll. If the facility that they're delivering at has a completely set of guidelines um, that exceeds what high tech is, or maybe it's just a different type of facility, um, you know, it's it's our responsibility to make sure that um, everybody involved is adhering by those guidelines so in short uh 
you're going by whoever has the strictest plan for the facility you're going into at the time. Correct. Yeah. Yep. When it when it comes to contractors, because you brought that up, um, the executor states that environments need to have an on-site supervisor. Um, how do you manage that in branch offices where you don't have or where you don't have staff? Um, there are locked offices available to real estate agents in various locations. So how do you manage an environment where people get to come and go without somebody sitting there as a gatekeeper? Do you have to do you have to have a gatekeeper now? I think they said the gatekeeper, well, we'll kind of like the word gatekeeper, but I think what they meant by gatekeeper was for construction. Um, I know that in uh in, in my office anyway um you know we have a policy and procedure written too but i know in a lot of places it's going to be uh self-administered you know um i own my own company so i i don't answer to anybody as far as that but i can answer my own questions do i have a fever today how do i feel today should i go to work today um so it's the same thing so if you have an office building that you share um, you still have to have that policy and procedure written and to make sure that that person answers those 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 questions. You know, how do you feel today? Were you exposed to anybody that has it? Have you traveled outside the U.S. in the last few months? Uh, answer the same questions, and again, uh, you know, let them um, let them know that you know if they do answer yes to any of those questions, it's it's okay. You know. Uh, we have to get out of the mindset. Uh, if you guys remember, you know, just a few years back, everybody went to work sick because we had a job to do. We had to get this done. We were behind schedule. So we have a whole different mindset now that we have to try to uh, uh, try to get people to understand. So now if you are sick, please stay home. I want you to stay home. I care about you and everybody else around you. Um, so let them know that there's not going to be any repercussions uh, for staying home because you're sick. So when it comes to screening people, um, is it recommended that you also screen clients, customers, suppliers, other people who might be coming into your business? Yes, you can. As far as I know, yes, um, you can put that sign out there. And I don't know if you have a retail store, if you want to be taking everybody's temperature, but you still need to have that sign out there that says, you know, do you have this symptom? You know, are you sick? Do you have a fever? And, and maybe not every, um, building or, or location depending again on your industry that you're in would would necessarily have access to this but um, like for us specifically um, at, at high tech when we have interviews um, and candidates coming in and they're interviewing for the job um, again we we basically know nothing about the people that are walking in there so we do have um, an area that we kind of designated as like the screening room um, that they're specifically Again, like Michael said, they have to answer the list of questions. They have a series of, um, you know, paperwork basically that they go through briefly um, before we allow them into the facility. Um, and I would think that would probably be uh, recommended if if you're able to do that. I know again, not everybody's able to, but um, probably a good practice. Yeah. Well, I, and and it's kind of funny. Um, I'll use myself as an example. Uh, for this client that I went and visited yesterday, I wrote the policies and procedures on, you know, on what to ask, um, you know, just like the CDC has out there and stuff like that. So we, we did it for this, uh, for this client. And uh, when I went up there, the uh, construction uh, superintendent came up to me before he went on the premises and um, he literally asked me all my questions. <laughs> so I had to answer to the same questions that I wrote. So I had to answer the, you know, how do I feel? Have I been exposed to anybody? I had to answer all those questions before he even let me on uh, the job site. Um, one question talks about, we, you were talking about reporting to staff when somebody uh, tests positive. Do you need to report when somebody self quarantines due to exposure, but doesn't test positive? 
Ooh, that's a good question. So they, okay, let me get the question right. So they, they're self-quarantining, but they're not, they haven't been tested positive? Yeah, so uh, my, for example, my wife gets, is test positive. I have exposure to her, so I decide to self-quarantine, so I'm not bringing it into the office. Do you have to report that to the rest of your staff, knowing that I had been in the office yesterday? I would say yes. Um, again, I can't mention names. I'm sure people would be able to figure it out, but I mean, I can't literally say, hey, so-and-so is not coming to work because his wife's been tested positive for COVID-19, so he's at home self-quarantining. Um, but I should uh, tell my employees that, yes, um, yeah, I just have to word it differently. I just, like I said, I can't say who it is, uh, but I should definitely say, because if there was exposure, if you were exposed because, you know, your wife has it, then you were at work, you exposed everybody else to it. So we just have to monitor everybody's uh, condition, I guess. So another office question, um, do the are you sick questions apply if you're doing curbside pickup and drop off of documents, meaning the client would not be coming into the building, um, staff drops off or picks up documents at their vehicle outside the building. Um, so basically customers and clients aren't coming into the building. Do you still have to give those people the questions if you know they're they're pulling up and doing it by car drop off, I don't think so. But uh, again, uh, you have to write it in your policies and procedures. On depending again on what they're dropping off, um, but maybe some disinfecting that'd be more for, towards Tyler probably than anything else. But I would say some sort of PPE and disinfecting because I'm good. I have no idea what they're dropping off. Um, and then one other question that comes up for employees who travel to multiple locations, are they required to screen upon entry of each location or will the first screening of the day suffice? I would screen at every location, even though the answer is probably not going to change. Um, but that way you have documentation that it has been done. Um, a lot of times, uh, a lot of times people don't finish out their documentations. They just kind of do the quick answers. So my answer to that would be more: the more documentation, the more protection that you have. Yep. Okay. And we got a couple more questions coming in here. We've got about five minutes left, so if you do have questions, feel free to ask them. We're we're trying to get to all of them here. Um. What is the protocol for disinfecting paper, paper documents, envelopes, et cetera? Um, is it all right to let it set to the side for a day or two? Um, do you have to do that? Yeah, I would um, just dump disinfectant on it. No, <laughs> that probably wouldn't work. It would bleed and, it'd get real messy real quick. Um, yeah, we have um, tested that uh, with a, a couple different um, application methods. Um, it certainly does affect the paper, so I guess it depends on the end use um, it, and I guess the purpose for it. Um, the easiest way, kind of like what you referenced, is to just leave it in a uh, non-contaminated area. So maybe, you know, put on your PPE and your gloves. Uh, bring it to an area that's a controlled environment and uh, let it sit there for an adequate amount of time. And um, yeah, you be able to open it then at that point. But I guess depending on the, the urgency of what you need it, um, you could try to disinfect it um, lightly. It, again, would depend on dwell time and it might make it a little smudgy, but that would be up to your discretion. A question coming in asking about uh, contractors. Um, any recommendations for handling contractors who are not complying with cleaning disinfecting procedures? Um, obviously, with your own staff, you've got some direct oversight. And if staff members aren't following the rules, you, you can deal with it right there. 
Uh, any suggestion on contractors who might be coming in and not following the rules? One thing that I can say is that if you have a contractor coming into your facility, think of it this way, that facility, that's your house. If I don't follow your rules to your house, then you have every right to uh, basically to escort me off your premises. I have to follow your rules um, regardless. Um, it's, it's just like that with OSHA. If OSHA comes uh, for an audit and you have a policy that says, you know, hard hat, safety glasses, uh, uh, steel toed boots beyond this point, even that OSHA inspector has to abide by those rules before they go out on that floor. So if you have a contractor that's not following your policies and procedures, um, it might be time to look for a new contractor. And be proactive about it. You know, don't don't assume that they know everything as the truck driver or whatever the situation is as they pull up that they're automatically going to know. Um, maybe you do have it posted on a door. Maybe he walks in a different door. So reach out to their safety manager or, or their, um, you know, driver personally and just say, hey, by the way, when you come here tomorrow, these are our policies because uh, nothing's worse than uh, having a delivery and turning them around and sending them back with uh, without any progress on the delivery. So um, I would, yeah, just encourage you to be proactive and uh, reach out to those people and let them know what, uh, what you have going on. Very good point. Tyler, is there considered an adequate amount of time regarding paper documents and how long they should sit? Paper documents, uh, I'd have to look, and maybe Michael, you, I don't know if maybe you would know this, I'd have to do some research, but I believe it said the the virus could live, but then, you know, you get into what type of surface. It could live on certain surfaces, last I checked, for up to, I think it was five days or something of that nature, but it didn't specify the type of surface. Um, so I, I'm assuming that's probably from the same individual um, wondering about the disinfectant of paper. I could, I could look into that a little bit more and then maybe uh, try, I could, Send you some more information on that and, and relay that along to them yeah it was a different customer but for both of you uh, the different business but but for both of you who have asked questions about paper we'll get an answer and i'll email both of you um with the and, answer and i do know one last thing on that we have i mentioned that uh, uh electrostatic disinfector sprayer it, you can adjust the basically the mist molecule size on that without getting too nerdy but you just make it finer so instead of squirting water on it, it is a very very fine mist and i've tested that on a couple documents with very minimal change to it um, you do notice it um, even after it dries you know it might slightly ripple the paper but um, yeah i'll get you some more information on exactly the the wait time thank you um we're down to the last couple minutes uh i'd like to bring phil back in for any final comments phil might have uh, to wrap things up here. Thank you guys, you did a great job, very informative. I think our attitudes as leaders in our respective organizations is essential that we really truly care about the uh, physical and emotional well-being of everyone that our organization impacts. So if you approach what you do that way, it's likely you're gonna come to a great uh, end result. And one other thing I was going to mention, if any of you listening are in our northern uh, Michigan service area, next Thursday, uh, May 28th at noon, we're going to have a northern Michigan business and healthcare town hall that's going to have a lot of experts uh, and community leaders on it, and we'd invite you to attend there. Troy? Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to Michael and Tyler. For, for doing this. We will be sharing out uh, the slide deck, the links that they've talked about, and some other information along with the video of this recording. Uh, it will probably come to you tomorrow by email, so look for that. If you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to reach out to the Better Business Bureau. Uh, we are happy to help in any way we can, and we can help connect to Michael and Tyler as well. Um, that email will also include their information if you have questions directly for them. But thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you have a fantastic day and a great Memorial Day weekend.
Thank you, everybody, for coming.